being interested in corvids definitely isn't my most unique personality trait. Um, I know they're a popular group of birds to be interested in because new studies about their intelligence are coming out all the time. Um, they can use tools, they can link tools together to build better tools. They're able to understand things like water displacement. So if you drop rocks into water, then the water level will rise and they can learn that and take advantage of it. Um, some studies suggest that magpies, at least, can recognise themselves in a mirror, um, that they're aware of themselves as objects in the world, um, and that they can do mental state attribution, which means that they're aware that other animals have internal experiences and minds just like they do. And a lot of this research could be quibbled with, um, because it's hard to pin down a lot of these things experimentally, but they're certainly a very interesting group of birds. And in this video, I'm going to be looking for clues as to how early medieval English speakers viewed corvids through their own cultural lens. Chauche, Cheo, Hira, Krawe, Raven, Rok, Agu. These are some attested words in Old English that seem to refer to birds from what we now think of as the crow family. Of course, the family we now think of as the crow family, the corvids, is a group based on close anatomical comparisons and genetic similarity, so the idea of this is a cohesive group of birds definitely or almost definitely didn't exist in the Old English period. There's no reason to think they put these species together in one group. This video will look at aspects of bird behaviour in early medieval culture, but what I'm going to do first is progress all these words through the regular sound changes that turned Old English into my dialect of Modern English. In reality, some of these words have fallen out of use, so their Modern English reflexes will be hypothetical, but other ones are still in use today. The late-ish Middle English reflexes around 1350 would be something like Chauche, Che, Hira, Krawe, Raven, Rok, Awe. By the time these words reached my accent, they'd be something like Chaff, Chi, Haya, Crow, Raven, Rook or Rook, and Or. Of these, only Crow, Raven and Rook exist unambiguously in Standard English, and given the variability of how Middle English auch turned out in Modern English, I would suggest that this chaff word must be the same word as the modern word chuff. So, four surviving words, eight species of corvid in the UK at the moment. This range of species is probably about the same as it was in the early medieval period. None of these are newly introduced species, and no corvid species have visibly gone extinct by then, and by visibly I mean as far as the archaeological record can tell us. Britain's never had any of the exciting blue jay species of North America or the green jays of Central America. We don't have any species of tree pie, we don't have any species of nutcracker. We just have carrion crows, hooded crows, magpies, Eurasian jays, rooks, jackdaws, ravens and chuffs. So how do these Old English terms map onto the bird species that lived around Old English speakers? The Bosworth Toller Old English Dictionary lists a few examples of where each of these words is used in Old English, and hopefully it has Latin translations of some of the words because of where in text they're used. So we can make some estimation of what they meant to an Old English speaker. The word krawe is glossed with the Latin word gornix, which does seem to have meant something like crow. But in another text it's glossed with a declined version of the word gorus, which almost certainly meant something like raven. It could be that this writer's Latin just wasn't very precise, or that they didn't know the Latin word for crow. Uh, it could be that the word krawe actually meant raven to certain speakers of Old English, or it could be that to this Old English writer at least, crows and ravens were just different versions of the same bird, and they were both called krawe. At this point it's important to point out that crows, ravens and rooks look very different to each other. Rooks have this very distinctive white-grey beak, and although crows and ravens have a similar body plan, ravens are much, much bigger. Most crows in the UK are the size of a large wood pigeon, whereas ravens are quite a bit bigger than a buzzard. But as a fascinating dissertation by Muhammad Eric Rahman Lacey points out, and I've mentioned this dissertation before, so I'd absolutely recommend you go and read it, appearance isn't the only way of grouping bird species, and in traditional dialects nowadays, um, or, or at least very recently, the words crow and raven can both apply variably to crows, rooks and ravens without the strict delineation there is in standard English. Of these three words in Old English, raven or reven, depending on dialect, is overwhelmingly the most commonly used in the literature that we have available to us, and it's the only one of the three that appears in poetry. 
All three of these focal corvid words have cognates in other Germanic languages, and the form of these cognates suggests that the Germanic languages didn't borrow these words from each other, but inherited them from their shared sort of grandmother language, Proto-Germanic. And these ancestral Proto-Germanic words can be reconstructed fairly confidently based on regular processes of sound change. And Lacey compared these Proto-Germanic words to modern writers' attempts at transliterating the calls of these birds, and he found that while all three species make a kind of cawing sound, like kreon, which became Old English krawe, only one of these birds ever makes the croaking sound that might be represented by hrokas. And that's not the rook, but the raven. It's worth noting here that carrion crows are much less vocal than other species like American crows, and they don't make the range of clicking and croaking sounds that American crows sometimes make. European ravens, on the other hand, do make a very wide range of vocalizations. Oh, click. So this argument from the bird's calls might suggest that while these words were still viewed as idiophonic, representative of the bird's call, the rook word is more likely to have included ravens. But what I would say is that these words may well go back further than Proto-Germanic, in which case by the Proto-Germanic stage they might already have become disconnected from the sound of the bird. Lacey also looks at descriptions of the appearance of the birds. Clearly the contrastive elements to look for here are size and beak colour because these things can be used to distinguish the adults of these species. Crows and rooks are the same size but have different beak colours, crows and ravens have the same beak colour but are different sizes, and ravens and rooks differ along both those axes. Unfortunately where you find descriptions of these birds they usually focus on the colour of the bird's plumage which is kind of iridescent blackish blue across all these species, and indeed they're described as swart or one in the Old English literature pretty much wherever their colour is described. All of these descriptions are of things which are um, identified as the hreven. One description describes the hreven as hyrnednebbon, horn-beaked, but this on its own is hard to interpret. It could mean the robust thick beak of the raven or it could mean the white beak of the rook or something else entirely. You can make arguments in any direction here, and if two different modern English speakers could interpret this differently, we don't have much hope of knowing what an old English speaker meant by it. What about behaviour? As a person with a keenish interest in birds but no academic expertise on them, I can recognise behavioural differences between the three. In my anecdotal experience of these species in modern Britain, crows and rooks both hang around in fields picking things out of the ground. Rooks have distinctive nesting behaviour, they kind of live in, in colonies called rookeries spread across several trees, and they're notoriously more social than crows, um, although you do see crows interact with each other. Crows are known for eating dead animals, um, and in fact the Cumbrian shepherd James Rebanks, who's my favourite author, describes a story from when he was a child where his grandfather had to drive away a load of crows because they were picking the eyes out of a still alive ewe who was sick with, I think, mastitis. So they don't necessarily wait for the animal to, to be dead before they start eating it. Ravens in modern Britain can be very difficult to find. I've only ever seen wild ones in very remote places um, in Scotland and Cumbria in the uplands. Although I know they're now spreading back into lower, um, more inhabited areas. And I've heard some people say that they've seen ravens in their garden. Although I also know that plenty of people don't realise how big ravens are. So I'd be willing to believe some of those accounts were actually just big crows. By incorporating descriptions with Old English translations of Latin texts and the slightly more slippery evidence from the bird's calls, Lacey suggests that hraven was a high-level term for all three of these birds, in the same way that in modern English deer is a high-level term for all of these mammals. By the Old English period, krawe and hrok would be lower-level terms, the equivalents of something like roe deer and red deer in English. But the term hraven may have been polysemous, I don't know if that's the right way of it, putting stress on that word because I've never heard anyone say it. Um, in other words, the word hraven would exist at two levels of generality. It could be used as a more generic term or as a more specific term. Within this system, krawe and hrok, both lower level terms more concretely, might have been used indiscriminately to refer to either of these birds. Lacey suggests that when it was used as a lower level term, Hraven was biased towards larger birds of this family, so ravens or potentially adult crows and rooks. 
So if I'm understanding Lacey's system right, which I may not be, if you saw a load of crows and rooks in a field, it might be appropriate to say that there were lots of ravnas in the field, or lots of hrokas, or lots of krawan. If you saw a raven come down and kill one of your lambs, and you told someone, oh, a bird's just come and kill the lamb, uh, and they said, was it a krawe? You might respond, no, it was a raven. And there it implies the larger species, since you're using it contrastively. It's not a krawe, it's a raven. So it's possible, um, and in fact I would suggest likely, that references to Havnas on the battlefield, for example, are sometimes just indiscriminate references to ravens, crows and rooks in general. An article from the 80s by Sylvia Horowitz, or Horowitz dives into an interesting mention of ravens within Beowulf. And spoiler alert if you're watching mine and Jackson's Beowulf series. Reste hine tha rum heort, retched hlivade, jaup und goldfach, Jast in the swaf, or that reven blaka, helvones winne, bleeth herd bodode. Rested him there, the full hearted or large hearted one, the hall loomed, gabled and gold covered, the guests slept therein, until the shining raven, the joy of the sky or the joy of heaven, declared glad heartedly, or proclaimed or vocalised glad heartedly. So this paints the raven in what seems like a fairly positive light for a bird that spends a lot of time eating corpses. It's the symbol of the morning. Horowitz's article explores what this means, and she suggests that the raven could represent death in a positive light. Um, and she draws on Old Norse sources where ravens can be associated with winning conflicts, um, where the association is with death, but the protagonist isn't the one dying, it's the antagonists of the story that are dying. And she also points out that Beowulf has a lot of Christian imagery in it, and that ravens in the Bible can be symbols of hope and things returning to order. Um, so an obvious example that she points to is the raven that Noah sends to assess the situation after the biblical flood. And she actually draws out a very nice interpretation of the raven as representing death in this pagan society from the Christian perspective of the writer. No matter how happy these pagans are in their pagan society, and no matter how happy they get by winning conflicts and acquiring things, the raven of death will always be present and it will always be ominous, because they're pagan and they're rooting their happiness in earthly things, and when they're dead the raven will pick at their corpses and that will be the end of them, they won't have eternal life. It's a very well written article which I'd recommend, um, although Jackson did make an interesting point in our recent Beowulf recording, which may or may not have gone out by the time this video does, um, where he interpreted um, the text as saying that the main characters slipped back into paganism when they were very desperate uh, and that by default they were Christian. Um, and I, I absolutely see where he's coming from on that. So to what extent can we imagine that Old English speakers saw Ravnas in the same way that Old Norse speakers did? Is it possible that Warden had two Ravnas that sat on his shoulders in the same way that Ordin does in Old Norse stories? Well, the fact that we really don't know much about the pre-Christian English belief system and there's not much evidence for, you know, anything about it means that we simply don't know how similar the English and Norse belief systems were because the Norse one is the only one we have stories from. Bird imagery features a lot on pre-Christian English material culture, um, on sort of coins and things, but as far as I know, the images are too vague to be positively ID'd as ravens. A thesis by Janina Ramirez... Uh, describes how the image of the Hraven became increasingly negative over the course of the Old English period, and that Bede in particular emphasised the corpse association. Bede was a Northumbrian writer who lived in the late 600s and early 700s, um, from, he was a monk from the northeast. And Ramirez points out that material culture from Northumbria tends to exclude the image of the Hraven from biblical scenes, like depictions of the flood story, so the Ruthwell Cross doesn't have this raven image, for example, whereas southern depictions of this, this scene do include the raven. So maybe there was some northern specific sense that the raven was a symbol of something bad. This could just have been a general local folklore thing, but given how soon Bede was writing after the Christianisation of Northumbria, the formal conversion of Northumbria, um, which was happening in the mid-600s, um, Bede was born in the 660s, so to me it seems very likely that there was still a decent number of de facto pagan people in Northumbria while Bede was writing. So if ravens were an important symbol to pre-Christian English people, 
Bede's literary persecution of the Raven could just be a reaction to the fact that pagans were still around and they had bel beliefs um, that were still actively being countered and that was still an active problem from the church's perspective. Bede fairly explicitly describes the way that he interprets raven imagery in the Bible. In the flood story, he draws a distinction between the raven and the dove, where the raven who doesn't return to the ark signifies people who are baptised and then become apostates, um, in other words, leave the church. And the dove represents Christians who are closest to salvation. And the olive branch that the dove brings back to the ark represents people who are baptised from heresy and who came to the church for salvation. One interpretation of the raven that we know was around in early medieval England says that it went and sat on a floating corpse, which maybe symbolises apostates being drawn to bad, unstable, evil, worldly things to sustain themselves. Bede may or may not have been aware of this interpretation. The thesis goes into a lot more detail and explains it better than I have here. It's no wonder that ravnas are viewed as having significance. These birds are famously good at problem solving, although a casual passerby could easily overlook that. They can recognise humans and form relationships with them. A specific human can be a social agent in the world of a crow. And of course, they're also adapted to this ecological niche where they eat dead things, along with non-corvid species like buzzards and kites. I haven't covered hooded crows here because they exist largely in Scotland and basically every source, um, every modern source that I look at describes them as being pretty much the equivalent of the carrion crow in the environments that they live in. So, um, you know, it, it may be that they actually existed further north than pretty much anyone who was speaking English in the early medieval period. And even if there were English speakers coexisting with hooded crows, it seems like uh, the level of detail in the literature we have wouldn't be enough to distinguish between the two. While the first three species we looked at look similar and belong to the same genus according to modern zoology, these four species belong to four separate genera. The one exception is jackdaws, which are sometimes put in the genus Corvus and sometimes in the genus, I think, Coleolus, although I'll put something on screen if I'm wrong. They're four very different birds in appearance and behaviour, and you might never guess that they were related to crows if you weren't explicitly told. So how do these birds behave outside of urban centres today? Magpies and jackdaws are the easiest to see nowadays. Uh, magpies pick through the ground on their own or in small groups and they'll eat dead things given the opportunity, although they eat a wide variety of things. Jackdaws are extremely social and vocal birds and if you get close enough you'll notice that they have whites in their eyes, which is fairly unusual among birds. And it seems like these are a communication tool one way or another, um, probably to make their presence obvious and deter other jackdaws from trying to colonise their nests. The most striking thing about jackdaws to me is that they gather in enormous groups, and I really do mean enormous. I've seen these large groups on about three occasions, um, and I've got decent footage of one of them. Jays are fairly shy, um, and I consider myself kind of lucky if I see them, although I normally see a couple per year. Um, but I always see evidence of them because they bury a load of acorns in the garden and then forget about half of them and then oak trees grow. So it would be interesting to find out whether an old English speaker was aware of the connection between jays and oak trees. Um, I suppose you'd have to make a bit of an inferential leap. Chuffs nowadays are quite rare, and I've never knowingly seen one. Um, I think they actually went extinct in England in the 40s and then naturally re-established themselves in the West Country within my lifetime. And within the UK nowadays, they very conspicuously exist along the coast and they seem to keep to the coast of their own accord now, although in other countries they also live in mountainous areas. Um, and it sounds like this is because of their preferred nesting environments, but I'm not an ornithologist so I don't know. 
but given how strictly they stick to the coast these days, I wouldn't be surprised if they'd always been a fairly coastal bird in Britain. With the proviso that bird behaviour can change over time, if you were an early medieval English person, it's a safe bet that you'd probably be very familiar with magpies in the fields um, and even closer to dwellings. You'd be familiar with jays from areas with tree cover like copses or other managed woodland. You'd be familiar with jackdaws from either of those environments. Um, and if you lived in an environment with chuffs, you'd probably see them in pasture uh, among livestock because they prefer cropped grass. So grass that's been grazed is perfect for them. Bosworth Toller helps us with the range of birds that might have fallen under the word hira. It points to two examples of it being translated using the Latin word bicus, which meant something like woodpecker. From an appearance and a behaviour standpoint, I can personally see why you might put woodpeckers and, for example, jays in the same category on the basis of their appearance. They all hang around in trees, they're all fairly shy, they're all kind of multicoloured in different ways. It gives an example from the Codex exoniensis of the hira being described as a bird that can imitate various sounds. Like a lot of jays, indeed, Eurasian jays can imitate other birds. Uh, and I think this observation shows an awareness of bird sounds that I think probably surpasses that of most casual modern observers. Um, I didn't know jays did this until fairly recently. But jays aren't the only birds that do this. Starlings do it a lot, and at least nowadays they're fairly common. Raman Lacey interprets the hira as a jay. Bosworth Toller has it as a woodpecker or magpie. I'm not sure where the idea of it being a magpie comes from here, but maybe there are some glosses with the Latin word pica that I wasn't able to find. I can see how a green woodpecker's call might sound a little bit corvidy, although it reminds me more of a jackdaw's call uh, than a jay's or a magpie's. Another thing about the hira is that from a literary point of view, it's not mentioned very much. At least from the literature we have nowadays, it seems like it wasn't held to the same level of symbolic importance as crows and ravens were. This means that A, we don't have a solid idea of what bird it referred to, and B, maybe the meaning was a bit more flexible from one community to the next. Words that are used less often are more susceptible to change and replacement in general. So I think that it makes more sense that terminology around less commonly seen or less culturally important birds might have been more flexible or changed more from place to place. If you're a dialectologist, then maybe you can um, agree with me there or disagree with me there. Ahu is refreshingly straightforward. It's glossed by Alfrich as Bika, the magpie. This uncomplicated translation makes sense in light of what I've just said. Magpies are common, vocal, and often have close-ish interactions with humans, at least nowadays, so you might expect there to be a more clearly delineated magpie category in Old English. But I don't want to read too much into just one gloss by one writer. Our last two words are cheo and chache. The word chache seems to have cognates in other Germanic languages, often meaning jackdaw, Bosworth Toller lists only one example of this word um, in the sentence on Chauchan Mere, on the Chauches lake or pool. And the way I see it, there are two angles on this. Other Germanic languages have this word focused on jackdaws, but it's clearly come to mean chuff in modern English. With no gloss, all we can do is guess. Cheo is another one with a few possible translations. It's glossed with Latin graculus, which means jackdaw, and Monedula, another word for jackdaw, and also cornix, crow. This suggests that jackdaws might have been similar enough to crows in terms of vocalisations and appearance to marginally count as the same group. Or it could be regional difference in what people meant by the word, although I think both of these glosses are from Alfrich, so probably reflects the, the perspective of one regional lect. Maybe the fact that there's no common, clearly delineated chuff word is a reflection of the fact that it only lived in certain areas. Or it could be that writers didn't know the Latin word for chuff, or it could be that they just put them in the same category as some other bird. I don't have anything like the right kind of knowledge to go into the science of bird calls, but as Lacey makes the point that they seem to have been important to Old English speakers, here are some examples of common calls from the seven species we've discussed today. I've personally only heard the carrion crow making sounds vaguely like this. 
often repeating them in sequences. I can think of one time that I heard what looked like a carrion crow making a weird American crow-style noise, but I found recordings online from countries other than the UK of carrion crows making a couple of more exotic-sounding noises from my perspective. If there is a lot of variety in the way they vocalise from one population to the next, then we can't, um, you know, we can't discount the possibility that they were making a wider range of sounds here in the early medieval period, although they may have just been making the same range of sounds that they make nowadays. This is the kind of call I usually associate with rooks, but I don't see them often enough to know if they have a wider range of noises. <coughs> Here are several raven noises from the Cornell Labs website. Um, and on the occasions I've seen them in the UK, they have made all kinds of strange noises. Magpies make a kind of cackling sound. Jays make a kind of raspy, screeching sound, but as I've said, they can imitate other sounds as well. Jackdaws make this sound, but when I hear it, it's usually lots of them in a group vocalising over each other. And as I've said, I've never seen a chuff, so I can't comment on what a casual observer hears from them, but this is a recording. I very much enjoyed making this video, and I'd be interested in doing other animal ones uh, if they appeal to people. But for now, I hope everyone's had a good Easter slash Passover slash Ramadan, and I'll talk to you again soon.